We are pressing on in our series. This is the second week of our series on uh, sort of the encounters of Jesus, encountering Jesus along the way. We're going uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem with Jesus uh, uh, he, and, and all the different encounters that he meets. Obviously, we can't look at every single one, but we're looking at many of them and sort of these unexpected sort of meetups that Jesus has with different people. And, and again, it's not unexpected to Jesus. It's unexpected to the people who are along the way, Right. And, and today we're, we're looking at the prodigal son. We're in Luke chapter 15, uh, which is a, is, is a fantastic, well-known story. You see it a lot uh, in both church and then in, in narrative throughout our society. It's just a popular story. But we love finding unexpected surprises, right? How many of you have ever in your life put your hands in your pocket in a coat and been like, oh, here's money, $20. Yay, found money. That's unexpected. How many of you have planted that money the year before and been like, oh, there it is, there's the money. I just needed a little pick-me-up, right? Or like you come into your office one day and and somebody has provided something for you, a little unexpected treat. Maybe somebody sprung for crumble cookies and they're like, hey, there's a little surprise, a little treat, a little thing to to help everybody uh, just kind of enjoy the day. We like unexpected surprises, unexpected treasures, unexpected gifts. We love things like that. They kind of help us keep going. We'll even treat ourselves in the middle of the day, right? We'll be like, oh, I need a little something to get me going. I'm going to work till lunch and then I'm going to take myself someplace nice like Chick-fil-A and I'm going to enjoy that. That's nice for me. I don't know if it's nice for you. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things that we really love in our life. But right now you may be in a position in your life where you could really use something unexpected. Because the things that you're expecting to happen maybe aren't what you had hoped. Maybe you're, you're worn out, you're tired. Maybe you feel guilty and you feel ashamed about something. Maybe you just feel overwhelmed by the burdens of living the life that you have. And you really could use something from somewhere, out of nowhere, just something that's unexpected to come and fill your life and maybe make things a little easier or make things feel like it's worth it again. And so, like I said, we're looking in Luke chapter 15 at the prodigal son story. And what I want us to do is I want us to see how grace is this unexpected thing that we need. It's this unexpected thing that we need and what it means for us. And so I want us to look at three things in Luke chapter 15 that grace means for us. And the first thing is this, the existence of grace means that something is broken. Grace means that something is broken. Look at verse 11 of chapter 15. And he said, this is Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. So this is the third, this prodigal son story is probably better called the lost son because it's the third in a trilogy of stories that Jesus is telling to the the Pharisees. The Pharisees have made a comment about how he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus tells a triad of stories. The first one is the lost sheep. The second one is the lost coin. And then the last one is the lost son. And they follow a formula. And each one follows the same formula for the most part. There is something that the person has that they lose, and then there is something uh, that that, that they they go and they kind of abandon everything that they have, and they go and pursue that thing that they lost. They find the thing, and then there's a big celebration. And that's the formula for the story. And he tells sheep, coin, lost son. And what should stand out to you, especially in this story, 
the, the lost son story, is all the brokenness that riddles this story. First, you have the disrespect that the son expresses to the father. He says, I, have, have, uh, I want the things that are coming to me. That's all he wants. I want my inheritance, which in that day and age, in that time, was to wish your father to be dead. And in the Jewish culture, that's an unforgivable sin. That is a breach in the relationship. It is a, it is a high crime. And then he leaves. He takes everything and he goes away. He doesn't just want what his father has. He didn't want anything to do, not just with his father. He didn't want anything to do with his family. He goes to a far country, as far away as he can get. And then there's just abject wastefulness. He pours his life into things that don't really matter. He expends the wealth, the life of his father on things that don't matter. It's wasteful. He spins it down and down and down. And then disaster strikes. There's a famine in the land. The guy might have been okay. He might have had a plan for managing his money to some extent, but he was just living there on the margins. As long as nothing went wrong, he was going to be okay. And then a famine hits. He doesn't have anything to eat. And so it seems like even the brokenness of the world conspires against him. And then he hires himself out to somebody in that country. Now, the hiring himself out isn't what we think. It's not like he goes down to the grocery store or the fast food restaurant and gets a job. That's not what's going on. He essentially subsumes his identity under the identity of this person. And we know this person is a Gentile. How do we know he's a Gentile? He's got pigs. And so we know he's in this far country. He's working for this Gentile. And again, this Gentile man is his whole identity now. He's divorced himself from being Jewish from the promised land because he left the land. We're assuming his father was living in the promised land. He's now gone to a far country. He's away from his father. He's away from uh, uh, his identity and he's working with pigs. Essentially, he's in exile. He is in exile. He has exiled himself. And it doesn't get much more broken than that for a Jewish audience. Essentially, what has happened to this young son is he is living under a curse. He's cursed because that's what the Old Testament teaches, that when Israel gets exiled, they fall under a curse. That's God's curse upon them to bring them back, to restore them to himself. So what does he do? He's actually pretty smart. He repents. He kind of comes to his senses. He's like, what am I doing? The people that have subsumed their identity under my father, the workers there, they, they have it way better than I do. I'm going back home. I'll just work for dad. And it's so obvious in these first few verses how broken the world is. And you know how we know how broken the world is? There is nothing in this story that we find incredulous. We don't look at this story and we're like, that's totally unbelievable. There are some stories in the Bible that are unbelievable. There's a donkey that talks at one point. I get it. And it's not Shrek. Surprise, surprise. But there's nothing in this story that we're like, that's unrealistic. That can never happen. It's the most believable story in scripture. You know how I know it's the most believable? It's because we keep telling it over and over again. Every, every movie, every TV show, every book is a prodigal son story almost. What do you think Star Wars is? It's a prodigal son story. Fall to the dark side, sun brings you back, throw the emperor down a well. I don't pay attention to the sequels. They don't count. It's a prodigal son story. We can identify with this story. We look at it. We see the broken relationships. We see the foolish behavior of a young man. We see the arrogance. We see people taking advantage of this man. They won't help him. Nobody will give him anything. We look at the world, the famine, and being like, golly, yes, I know what it's like to live in, in a society that all of a sudden... The environment around you conspires to just throw everything upside down. What do you think COVID was? All of this doesn't just create the conflict in the story. It shows us the necessity of grace. And there's a reason why grace is necessary. And it's because of how terrible and tragic this first part of the story is. We watch this man self-destruct. This isn't just a story, people. 
This is reality. This is our lives. All of us are a single decision away from wrecking everything. You are this close. You are on a knife's edge. Married folks, you're a moment of weakness away from wrecking your marriage by being with another person. Many of us that are parents feel the same. We're, we're one bad decision away. Every, every single decision we make with our children feels like the critical decision. And if I do the wrong thing here, they're going to be ruined for the rest of their lives. Single folks, you go on a date with somebody and there's so much pressure. Why is there pressure? It's because you've got to find the one out of seven billion people. The one. The one. There's a reason why it feels like a needle in a haystack search. On top of that, your, your one diagnosis, your one visit to the doctor, having everything turned upside down. We are this close. This is the definition of brokenness. Everything is so close to falling apart. Why do you think we're all anxious? Why do you think we're all losing sleep? Why do you think we're all terrified? Contrary to popular belief, I don't just love baseball, although it's back. I listened to a spring training game yesterday. It was amazing. But I also really love soccer. And there is nothing more frustrating and more anxiety just inducing than watching the team you root for protect a 1-0 or a 1-1 draw. Especially when your team's not very good, which mine is not. And so you just sit there and you watch the better team lobbing in crosses, corner kick after corner kick, and they're just heading it away or barely getting away, and you're like, oh my gosh, would you please, why can't we just win five to nothing? So soccer is this sport where people kick it, <laughs> kick a ball, and you're on the edge of your seat, and that's what many of us feel like. That's what many of us feel like our lives are like is you've got a little bit ahead or, or you feel like you're just even and you're just hanging on by the skin of your teeth and the world's just driving shot after shot after shot at whatever it is you think the goal of life is and, it, and you're just barely keeping things out and you're struggling because you know if the ball goes in that net, if whatever it is you're so afraid of happens, the house of cards comes down. And the really frustrating thing is that there's no way to ensure that this does not happen to you. You can have all the education in the world. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the success in the world. And there is nothing that can keep everything out of your life. It keeps every bad thing from happening to you. It can't do it. And so I think, I think we would all acknowledge that the world is broken. And if we all acknowledge that, then we have to think something has to fix this. And that's why grace is so important. The fact that there is something broken and the fact that we can't fix it in and of ourselves shows that there has to be the existence of something else that will fix it. Something outside of us, outside of the world, something extra has to come in and deliver us. And I, we believe as Christians, it's grace. It's grace in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what comes from outside to repair the brokenness. It's this unmerited favor of God. It's something you don't deserve. It's the $20 bill in your pocket that maybe you didn't put there. That's grace. It's unmerited favor. Which leads us to our next thought about grace today. If grace means that something's broken, that also means grace means that something can be restored. Look at verse 20, the tail end of verse 20. It says, he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Son makes the journey home and his father sees him from a long way off. The word long way off and far country are the same word. 
So when it says he goes into a far country, and so it's almost like the father sees him in the far country and runs to him. This homecoming is more than the young man could have hoped for. First, the father feels compassion. He didn't just go to his son because it'll look good on, on social media. He didn't just go to his son because, well, I'm his dad. I'm supposed to. I told him I'd always love him, but I really don't like him, so I'm just going to, no, 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 no. He feels compassion. His heart breaks seeing his barefoot, destitute son come home. And so he runs to him. He runs to him, which is something that elderly people didn't do then. Elders in society didn't run. It, it, it was a, a, an undignified thing, which, have you ever seen like an 85-year-old do a marathon? I find that to be just incredibly like challenging to myself. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? They can run a marathon. I need to gear back on the things I'm eating. But the father runs to him. And then it says that he falls on his son. And the word falls upon means exactly what it means here. Like he like falls on his son and kisses him, just kind of engulfs him. But it can also mean like when bad circumstances happen to somebody, they fell upon hard times, right? And that's something we see in the son's life. Bad circumstances fell upon him. Yes, he made bad decisions, but he also had bad things happen to him as well. And the father comes and falls upon him and he kisses him. And I love it. The son starts his speech. He's like, dad, I've sinned before heaven and before you and on and on. And he, he gets like through one sentence and the father cuts him off. And the reason the father cuts him off, he starts talking to his servants. He says, hey, in fact, if you notice, nobody actually talks to the son in this entire story. Nobody talks to the younger son at all. And he says, go get a ring for him, a robe for him, and put sandals on his feet. And of all these, the sandals is the most important. The sandals, if you were barefoot in that day and age, it, it meant uh, you were just absolutely degraded, low, poverty-stricken. And to get new shoes was to get a new life, to be restored completely. The young man comes home and he doesn't expect to be restored, but that's what grace is. Grace is the hope, is the message, is the means by which we can be restored. The depth of the brokenness the son has gotten into is immense. There's no way he digs himself out of this. I mean, he goes home and I don't know what his line of thinking is other than I'm gonna work for my father. But maybe he thinks I can work for my father and I can, I can get better, Right? Like I can, I can improve, I can rehabilitate my image before my father and maybe, maybe I'll be able to pay him back some. Or maybe I'll be able to, to just enjoy uh, being around people that I know are good people. Or maybe I can show him how sorry I am by the effort that I put in. And when the father interrupts him, the father cuts that line of thinking off at its knees. And there's a reason why he does this. It's because the son doesn't have an eye towards restoration. He has an eye towards a diminished role and a diminished place in the father's economy. The, the father has only interest in restoration. He has zero interest in having his son back under any other condition besides full restoration. That's the only condition he will accept his son back. And oftentimes we think the same thing when we approach the Lord. We come to the Lord after... Uh, in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty, in a place where we need God's grace. And we start hoping for some kind of bargain, some kind of working contract relationship, because we all know we've fallen short. We all know we've messed up. Even if just for an afternoon or an evening or a weekend or a week or a few months, you said, God, I know you want me to do things this way, but I'm really angry at this person and I'm going to do things my way. Or God, I really like the really attractive person and I'm going to go do things my way for a while and I'll come back. Or God, I know that you have really generous ideas of what business practices are. I'm going to make my fortune however I need to make my fortune and then I'll start giving and I'll use my money that I get however I get it for the glory of God. We've all been the prodigal son. We've all gone away from the love of the Father into a far country to do things our way. And when we come back, when you come to your senses, 
you start trying to bargain with God. You start realizing, I can't expect anything out of God. I, 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 I don't deserve anything. But that's not restoration. That's not what God has in mind for you. God has no desire for you to have a diminished role in his economy. He wants you back. Grace means that there can be restoration, not demotion, not hired back at a lower position. Restoration means assuming the role you had before. In many cases, it means taking on an even greater role than you had before. Does anybody uh, uh, restore old cars? You like to, to know about people restoring old cars? I was reading about this this week. There's actually a, a debate within the restoration community, I suppose, um, as to whether you restore a car back to its original, original all the way through, or there's people that are like, you can make the car look the same, but update it. Put Bluetooth in there. Make it safer. Better headlights. Better seat belts. And there's debate within the community. What's better? And most people would say that, that the original is, is more valuable but it's about what would you want to drive? What would you want to experience? God wants to bring us back. He wants to restore us and then update us. He wants, we, 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 as humanity, we lost what Adam and Eve had. They lost it. And God wants to restore us to bring us back to that and then upgrade it. Because you get a transformed heart. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And it's possible today that you don't feel like you can be restored. That you are so broken, you're so shattered, you're so wrecked, that you don't feel like God can do anything to restore the fragile pieces that have been torn apart today. And that doesn't necessarily mean alienation from God. I mean, you just feel so worn out. You feel so tired, so broken. And so we make speeches to God sometimes, right? We go to God and we say, God, I'm sorry I did this. I promise it won't happen again. I'll make you a priority. Or God, I know that I keep messing up here or I keep going after this thing. I'm sorry. Or maybe you go to God and you're like, God, I'm trying everything I can to make this work and it's not working. Help me. And so you start making these kind of speeches to God about how if God, if you'll do this, if you'll, if you'll just come through, if you'll just do this, if you'll do this, if you'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this, then I'll do this. So many of us come before God looking for employment because it makes us feel more comfortable. If I do this for God, and if I do this for God, he'll pay me my wages and then I can live my life the rest of the way I want to because that's what a job is. A job a career, employment, is being able to say, I'm going to live a certain way in my off time. They don't have a claim on me when I'm not around. And God says, no, that's not what I want. That's not my plan for you. My dream for you, my hope for you, my idea for you is for you to be in a full relationship with me, full restoration. You don't work for me. I want you back as my child. He wants you to trash the ideas of, of whatever you think a relationship with God could be and realize that he has so much more in mind. He wants to elevate you to the highest heights of sonship and daughtership. And I know that's hard to trust. That's hard to believe. So how can we know it? How can we believe it? How can we know that this is what God has for us? Well, Grace means that something's broken. It means that something can be restored, but it also means that something, someone is searching for us. Someone is searching. Look at the end, verse 24. Sorry, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. And refused to go in, and his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Final character that we really haven't talked about that kind of gets sidelined throughout the story is the older brother. The older brother. And if you remember, there's a formula to the story, right? In each of the, th- the, the three stories, there's supposed to be a formula. Something gets lost, somebody fi- goes and finds it, they find it, and then there's a celebration. And the prodigal son has all of those elements except for one. And Tim Keller points this out. He says that the older son should have been the one to go and look. He should have been the one to go bring his younger brother back, and he's not. And we find out the reason why he doesn't do that is because he is just as alienated from the father as the younger brother is. Just as alienated. He just hasn't had to go as far away to to show it. But he is. He is. Notice who he asks what's going on. He asks the servant what's going on. One, he doesn't even know why there's a party being thrown, which shows he's so far from the house. He doesn't even know what's going on. But secondly, he doesn't go in and ask the father, Dad, what's going on? He asks a servant. And this tells you how the son views himself. Because the younger son, his highest hope when he comes back is to simply ingratiate himself to his father and say, maybe I could be a servant. Maybe that's that's the best I could hope for. But the older brother views himself as nothing more than a servant. He views himself as just a hired worker. And all this time, it's built up resentment towards his father. And he finally explodes at his father at the very end of the story. He says, you've never given me anything to celebrate with my friends. Notice who's not invited to the party, the father. He says, you've never given me anything. And then he accuses his younger brother. He says, this son of yours has consumed your property. That word for property is bios. It's where we get biology from. It means life. What he's saying is, your son has consumed your life. He's a bloodsucker. He's a vampire. He's a leech. And you just celebrate him. Like it's no big deal. He's drained everything. And you throw a party for him. One commentator pointed out that the father's response shows his concern is not with defending himself or defending his younger son. His greatest concern is the spiritual condition of his older son. Because you see, his son is infected with a spiritual disease called acedia. It's acedia, it's A-C-E-D-I-A, acedia. Acedia is this thing where when something good spiritually happens to somebody else, you experience disappointment, bitterness, frustration. And it's the case that the older brother has. He is riddled with acedia. Something good has happened. A son has returned alive that they thought was lost, and he has nothing but resentment for it. And you know what? That's the end of the story. Have a great week. We have no idea what happens to either one. We don't know if the the younger son wakes up the next morning and thinks, man, can't believe it. I'm just going to go back to doing what I wanted to do. We don't know if the older brother actually says, you know what, dad, you're right. I'm so sorry. I'm going to come into the party, kisses his brother on the cheek and says, I'm so glad to have you home. We missed you. We don't know what happens. And you know why we don't know what happens? It's because it's not the point of the story. Because remember who the audience is that Jesus is talking to. 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus is comparing the religious leaders to the older brother. And obviously the tax collectors and the sinners are the younger brothers. See, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, have been working in the field. They've been working to maintain the law. They've been working to maintain the temple. They've been working to keep God being honored in Israel. But you know what? They're far from the heart of God. They're far from the heart of the Father. And at this point, you have to ask yourself, and this is the point of parables, is where am I in the story? Who am I in this story? Where am I? Are you the son that has traveled so far away? And now needs to draw close to the Lord. Are you the calcified religious person who hasn't strayed physically far from the church? You're here every single Sunday. You're even here sometimes on Wednesday. You're even serving and you are far, far, far from the heart of God. 
Where are you? Where can we find you? You want to know how you find yourself? It's what you celebrate. Both brothers are exposed. Their spiritual condition is exposed by what they celebrate. The young son goes out and he celebrates wild living. His spiritual, his character shallowness is exposed by the kind of parties he goes to. And the older brother, his spiritual shallowness is exposed by the kind of party he refuses to go to. So what do you celebrate? What do you refuse to celebrate? What do you have a hard time celebrating? What breaks your heart? What makes you feel cold? What do you resent? The parties you throw, even the little parties you have in your heart, when you're like, oh, I'm going to treat myself, this was a good day. Well, what made it a good day? When you're coming home from work and you're angry, what is it that made it a bad day? What makes it so hard to celebrate for you? That tells you where your heart is. That tells you where your idols are. That tells you what you value. It tells you everything about what you need to know about where your heart is. Because Jesus says what? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Your parties expose you. But don't fear. There's grace. We know this because someone is looking for you. Someone actually came and tracked you down. That's, that's what Jesus does. That's why the Son of God came into the world, to implore you to come home, to leave behind the parties that, we leave, that leave us feeling empty and broken and sorrowful, and to come home. He invites you to come and celebrate with his Father. He's calling you to come home to him. He doesn't want you out there at the parties, the things you celebrate. He wants you, he wants the dead to come alive again. And he does this, the means to come home is by his own death. Remember, what, is the, what does the older brother say? He says, this younger son of yours has consumed your life, your bios. And Jesus gives up his bios, he gives up his life to provide a way home for us. That's why he dies. Why do you think when we take the Lord's Supper, we eat and drink what? The body and blood of Christ. That's the symbol. Why? We're consuming his life. They slaughter the fattened calf to create the celebration. Who do you think the fattened calf is in the story? It's Jesus. The party is started by the death of Christ and his resurrection. Whose property do you think we've been consuming this whole time? It is Christ again and again and again. And he invites you to come and see, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you understand the lengths that the Father has gone to to bring you home. He sent his greatest treasure. We get so excited about finding unexpected treasure. We get so excited about finding that precious little $20 in our pocket. But what if rather than you putting that in there, what if somebody in your family every single year put 20s in everybody's pocket? This is what God does. God comes into your life and he starts filling your pockets with his grace that we don't expect, that we don't anticipate, that we don't earn. And you, if you would just shove your hands in your pockets, which can't believe I'm telling you as a church and a worship service to put your hands in your pockets. Usually we're like, take your hands out of your pockets. But if you put your hands in your pockets, you will see that they're overflowing with God's grace. So many of us are so eager, grabbing everything else, reaching out for every other means to, to try and give our life gratification, to give our life hope, to give our life purpose, to fix the broken things in our life. And God says, I will, I filled your pockets with everything you need. Usually there's lots of different ways to respond. I think today there's only two. You can choose to come home or not. You can stay out, stay at the party, whatever it is you celebrate in your life, you can stick with it, or you can abandon it and come home to the Lord. That's really the only two choices you have today. And it's up to you. God wants to bring you home. And some of you might be like, well, I'm not that far from the Lord. Maybe. Maybe you're just not that far from the building, the church building. Maybe you need to recognize that your heart is farther away from God and some people that you would think are completely lost. 
You need to trust in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because we do have a tendency to let our heart grow cold. Do you have acedia? Do you have this critical illness of looking down on other people's spiritual experiences because you're not having that? It's jealousy. Grace is necessary because the world is broken. And we all admit that. I, I don't think there's anybody in the world that would not admit that the world's not broken. It is. And grace also tells us that there can be restoration. There can be hope for us because somebody came and looked for us. And somebody came and looked for you. And he's looking for you now. 